Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest installment in our UXDX online series. I hope you're as excited as I am for the talks this evening. But before we jump into the content, I'd like to give a very quick introduction to UXDX and why we host these sessions. So at UXDX, our mission is to help companies shift from building software products using waterfall or water scrum fall type methodologies to really um, empowering autonomous product teams to iterate and build the products that customers really want. Now, the reason why that's our mission is because we believe it's a more effective, efficient, and sustainable way of working when you're in a high change environment. And the reason why I threw that last little bit in there is because if you're in a low change environment, it makes sense. Create a team, get them to solve one problem, disband them and move them somewhere else. But I've worked in a lot of companies where there's literally hundreds of parallel projects going on at any given time. So it doesn't make sense to keep disbanding the team after they start to learn a little bit about the customer and that space. So in those cases, it makes sense to have dedicated teams um, iterating continuously and making sure that they're continuously improving that their product and getting that best fit with the customer. Now that's really easy to say, and it's not so easy to do. <laughs> and that's where the talks come in. So no one talk is gonna cover the entire breadth of the product delivery life cycle, but we ask people to share their experiences with how they're improving their elements or their part of the process so that maybe you can get some ideas of what you could apply in your context in your organization. So please do ask any questions that you have. The speakers are, are looking forward to and expecting um, some, some challenging questions um, because that shows that you're trying to think about how can I apply this knowledge in my context? So please do take advantage of the generosity of our speakers tonight. And sometimes um, we get so many questions that we can't answer them in the time slot that we have. But in those cases, we have the UXDX community Slack group. And in there, one of the channels asks the speakers. So any questions that we don't have time to get through today, we'll post them in there and then we'll invite the speakers to come and answer them. But that's enough about me. You're not here to listen to me. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the evening. So Pago, who's the chief strategy officer of Ready Fire, Aim, or sorry, of etc., will be talking about Ready Fire Aim. So I'd like to welcome Pago to the stage. Thank you so much. Listen, sir. All right. Over to you. Thank you. Just go away. All right. I'll just start away. Um, all right. Thanks everybody for listening in. This is going to be an interesting conversation, primarily because. All the stuff that we just talked about uh, are, is, is not the stuff that I'm focused on primarily. I'm coming at this from a marketing perspective or a launch perspective. And obviously the notion of ready, fire, and aim is, is wrong, right? That's out, that's out of sequence. And the question that we get a lot of times or some of the challenges that I see along the way is that we're launching before we're really ready or we're aiming at anything. So the one thing that I want to focus on today, hopefully this benefits some folks on the conversation, uh, is about really positioning what it is that you're about to build. But the first thing we're going to start well, start off with is a story. And we're going to be talking about your teeth. All right, stick with me. There's a, there's a reason behind this. Um, this icebreaker is courtesy of The Power of Habit. Uh, it, this is an amazing book. I uh, can't talk enough about it. Go get it for yourself, but I want the, I'm not going to plug the book here overall. But take a look at it. Um, so in the early 1900s, I have no idea why in America nobody was brushing their teeth. Um, even though toothpaste has been around for quite some time, even dating back, you know, in, in the BC time frame, um, I think we like our teeth. Uh, and I guess it wasn't cool or something. For some reason, people weren't picking up on it. And so a new toothpaste brand came onto the market called Pepsodent. It was introduced in about 1915. And these guys, uh, traditionally kind of in our space from an advertising and a marketing perspective, hired uh, Claude C. Hopkins, probably one of the most famous ad uh, executives at the time, maybe really of all time, and they engaged him to promote their product. So he dug into the research and, and dug into the product, and of course he dug into the user experience, and he stumbled upon a medical insight that positioned toothpaste in a way no one else had done before which makes perfect sense because he wrote a book because he was a smart guy from a scientific approach to advertising. It perhaps was something remarkably different for them. But what he did was he introduced an idea for a campaign that was just run your tongue across your teeth. No, really, literally. The campaign said, 
just run your tongue across your teeth and you will feel this film because what he'd studied was this bacterial film that actually caused teeth to look a little off color. And of course, promoting the brand, Pepsodent removes the film. Obviously, success story three weeks after the first Pepsodent ad campaign, demand for the toothpaste exploded. And lo and behold, a little bit after that, about a decade later, uh, more than half of the country is brushing daily. And Pepsodent, of course, was one of the most successful brands in the world. And this one campaign by itself is credited with, uh, you know, kind of creating a habit from our country's perspective, from a national toothbrushing perspective. <clears throat> Something us marketing nerds call category lift, you know, rising tides and all that. So what, what's the big deal about this? Why, why is this story something that I want to talk about? Even products that are needed, right, hopefully, that solve a really basic problem that are seemingly really easy to adopt need the right story. They need the hook, they need the marketing, they need positioning to really get things going. And so I think each of us here uh, probably are here because of a multitude of reasons. Uh, maybe we are the creator, we're a founder, maybe some other genius started something with an amazing idea that started one late night in a pub with a, a, bunch, of, a bunch of friends. Uh, regardless of what our role is today, a developer, a designer, a strategist, a marketer, a founder, or whatever, our singular goal is the customer. We should always have our customer in mind. We should always get that idea to the customer, whomever they may be. And so this journey, of course, is pretty difficult. And I'm going to assume that most of the folks today are here from a product development perspective you know, or an NPD perspective for short. And I wanted to share a bit of the full cycle, life cycle, so that you can understand how much we count on you to develop adoption by the customer and why we care so much about the customer journey and empathy and, you know, the so what about the product. And I know the journey is absolutely nuts. Um, it is complicated. It's long. It's sprinty. It's hurry up and weighty. It's overly sophisticated. It's underfunded. Sometimes it's overfunded but it requires consistency and patience along the way. And most importantly, it can start with positioning, your positioning, not the ad guy uncovering some bacterial coating on your teeth. If you have the position for a product or feature, obviously it influences how you categorize that product within a portfolio of things like full-size toothbrushes or travel toothbrushes or electric toothbrushes. But in the end, they're all toothbrushes as a category. And once you identify where or how it fits in as a category, you can line it up against other similar different products in their categories like floss or pastes or tongue scrapers or mouthwashes to create a roadmap to tell a broader story. Obviously, you see where I'm going with this about dental products. And then, then once we have all that together, we can get going because it doesn't really make sense for your team, especially your lead salesperson to go out there and promote one brush but rather a galactic assortment of dental hygiene goodness, right? We all want to do that uh, at the end. Okay, that's a little silly analogy. And I was told uh, we're going to talk about teeth at the beginning. So I want to share six things with you today that hopefully provides you some insights from an MPI perspective or from a marketing perspective of why it is so important for the developers, the producers, the builders, the dreamers to share your journey along the way, especially how you position your ideas. It's your responsibility. This is no naggy statement about it's your responsibility, you better go do it. It's your responsibility because one of the most powerful things from a Salesforce perspective, I always love saying is that a company's employees are the ambassadors of a brand. And maybe it's not your core responsibility, um, but you have the power to influence audiences more than you think. Your positioning becomes proverbial North Star. So every step along the way of the journey requires a reminder, constant reminder of what we're doing for the customer. Don't lose sight of that. No longer how, no matter how long you've been doing this, no matter how much it's changed, and maybe you've lost sight of it. Maybe it doesn't really matter to you anymore. It's all about customer centricity in this in the end. <clears throat> and even if you didn't start the process, or maybe you're doing the process late, the team or the person maybe before or after or above or sideways or next to you, they can always benefit from your alignment. It's always good to share the commonalities for the vision and the positioning that we have, because at the end of the day, we have to constantly make sure that we reinforce why we got started on this process all, all, all along. 
Second thing I want to share with you, difference between description and positioning. It's red and it's a bit sour. So I'm either talking about a cherry sour, chewy candy or wine. That's a description. It pairs well with the scallops, and roasted beets and a dollop of ketchup with the aromatic note that you get what I mean. So there's a difference between positioning and how we do that overall. And this is what I'm building overall, right? In terms of how you're positioning your story. Am I gonna tell you what I want you to know about my product? Or am I gonna tell you that I'm gonna build a product for what you wanted? And I built this specifically for you. And there's different approaches. I call that, we call that inside out or outside in uh, positioning. But most importantly, be special. Make it unique, make it memorable, make it exclusive, be exciting, be relevant, and be compelling above all. Third thing we'll share with you today is about development and marketing. Obviously, you put the word product before that, product development, product marketing. There are some significant differences. And the first thing I want to talk about is what is career path, your job, or your profession overall? And I'm sure that uh, today they're all spectrum of experience and expertise here. Um, where do you want to go? Are you somebody that wants to be an evangelist to tell the story about the product to help guide your journey? Are you sick? Are you, you want to be the most uh, significant support maven to drive, uh, drive success for repeat visits and loyalty for the product as a whole. And so as a developer, what, how do you become a marketer? Or maybe as a marketer, it's about understanding how I can learn how to, how development impacts and the back, back end of what I'm developing overall. And most importantly, you're closest to the it, right? Some of the most powerful and compelling presenters I've ever seen have been the builders because you're so close to it. Um, I'll never forget riding in an elevator uh, with the chief executive of a Fortune 100 company. Uh, I, was, I was 25 at the time. And the guy asked me, um, do you know what my job is? And of course, immediately I thought this was uh, this is the end of me. Uh, I have no idea what's going on. Um, he said, I'm the number one salesperson in this company, not in terms of sales, but he has to represent the company, the people, the brand, the offer, the opportunity across all spectrums. And it makes sense that he grew through the role and he'd been there his entire career. This was his only job. Of course, he knew his origins. I knew his origin story as an engineer and a foundry in Syracuse, but I never forgot that conversation because there was nobody that was more compelling or passionate about this brand or this product than the people that are closest to it without a shadow of a doubt. And the thing that I found more, more so than anything else is that builder, the maker, the dreamer, or if you're like me, the nerds in the world, your story will be correct because you've, you've spent the hard work developing, planning, researching, ideating, iterating, failing, succeeding again. And this intelligent divergent thinking if packaged in an amazing, straightforward and clear narrative can be delivered, everybody can understand what the what the offer is or what the solution or where your focus is across the board. Fourth thing to talk about is the audience, or in this case, the persona. We all seen giant stack of research, right? There's demographics, there's psychographics, there's geographics, there's behaviors. Um, there's differences between each of these. And chances are, if you don't know, what you need to say about a product or how to position a product or how to articulate a statement, there's something that you can probably extract from a demographic, whether it's you know something oriented to age or income or gender, or perhaps from a psychographic where you understand attitudes and personality and interests, or maybe even geographics, because it's significantly different to sell or promote and discuss about a product with, between regions and languages and even climate, like trying to sell warm winter jackets to somebody in the desert really doesn't make any sense unless it's a cold desert. And then of course there's behaviors, right? Interactions and patterns and, and transactions about how the individuals operate across the board. Most importantly, from an audience perspective, what or who will go, is going to create the most positive forward movement? And I like to break this down into really three audience types. You have influencers, you have buyers, and you have users. And if you have the ability to position whatever it is that you want to do to the right person that can make the most positive evangelistic movement from an influencer perspective or the best product review from a user perspective or the most compelling uh, proposition for uh, life cycle, for example, from a buyer perspective, 
um, you have to understand that each one of these influences each other and coming at them with a succinct type message for what it is that you're, you're offering can do amazing work. And keep this in mind, just because you like the product, because you're working on a product or you're developing and you're positioning, and you're talking about things, you're talking to a person, not a brand, because who I am between the working hours of eight to five or, 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 or midnight, however long you work, is significantly different between who you are from five to eight. You know, there's the professional side and there's the personal side and how you position and talk about things across each can and should be significantly different across the board. Last thing, uh, second thing, last, second last thing we'll share is going to be about AM and SOM. Um, obviously, there's all the analytics that you can get into from a research perspective to look at it. And I know what they stand for, and I, there's all kinds of permutations of who you sell into and who you position against, but you got to know where the six, where you're going to find success, you know, whether it's in the total addressable market, which is, you know, the largest of the large possibility for sales to sell into or the product to have influence in, or the serviceable tangible market, which is probably the focal point and the target that you have. Because at the end of the day, what you're building or why you're doing it or what you're most passionate about, you probably want to relate to it a little bit. Are you just making shoes in general or are you making lightweight, high performance running shoes for ultra marathoners? Uh, and what do you have the most familiarity and experience with to connect with the audience, to position your product or your offer or your conversation in a way that makes them turn their head, stand up and pay attention to what it is that you have to offer? And I know it's probably contra academic because academically they say to promote the, the, the larger scale. You have to understand your stage and phase of, of where you are in your life cycle because you don't want to overextend your reach. I always suggest smaller at the start and broader at the big. Um, I've seen and heard from too many brands that launch stuff that, you know, I'm seeking world domination when they could have succeeded amazingly with a very narrow, tight focus in terms of what they were doing from a launch perspective overall. And then one of my favorites, BMS, it stands for brand marketing and sales. And it depends in terms of the order that they have, but, you know, the reason why foundationally the power of the brand is one of the most important things and the way you position it, the way you talk about it. When you talk about your employee base or your, your ambassador, so to speak, you want to get that message correct because ultimately what you need at each phase is going to be triggered based upon what that message influences at the marketing phase or ultimately at the close phase. And there is not one size fits all because ultimately whether uh, you're developing uh, a, a core product, whether it's software, whether it's a piece of hardware, whether it is a service, uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, building a product requires um, simplicity and consistency and repeating some core messages across the board. So I'll leave you with these kind of six over, overarching topics, if you will. Uh, there are dozens more that you could take away, hopefully maybe one or two of these points or something relevant to you that you can take forward or just do some additional research on. These are all uh, public information that you have access to that can broaden your, your knowledge base or information throughout the board. And, and one thing I'll leave you with just as an FYI, talking about um, this world of MP3 players. Um, and I've, I've been on this planet for a while and I remember seeing my fair share of, of uh, digital uh, media players back in the day. Um, and this all started before 2001 and there were dozens of them and they were amazing and they stored and they played and they, and they, they menued and they, they advanced and they playlist, but then suddenly something happened where one brand came out and positioned themselves across all the others. We all know who that is. And we all know that this brand consistently does this specific task of positioning. Well, uh, I was introduced in 2001 when they're a C of uh, MP3 players beforehand. So anyway, this is just another example of just amazing messaging for, for across the board. I know regular cadence people will actually introduce themselves up front. I thought I'd introduce myself up and back. I'm Pago. It was a pleasure talking with you today. I like to think of myself as a 50-50, 50-50 kind of guy. Half of, my half of my time I've spent on the client side, half of my time I've spent on the agency side. Um, I do consider myself a builder, cut my teeth on code and and some of the early site development from 92, uh, but ultimately um, had to force myself into becoming uh, a promoter of that. So maybe I found my narrative, my voice. I've been a native since uh, 87. So building computers, pioneering the web as a lifetime geek, 
uh, and I'm always curious of things going forward. And please feel free to reach out to me, uh, hit, hit me up on chat or Slack or whatever to follow up if there's any questions that you that you have or any topics that you'd like to find some more information on. And go brush your teeth. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I didn't know I was going to get so much insight into to brushing teeth and, and the history <laughs> of that talk. But thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, so just a reminder to everybody out there, if you have any questions from the talk, I can see Kasim has uh, made a comment about a thousand songs in your pocket. But if anybody has any questions that they would like to put to Pago, um, please do write them in here um, on whichever platform that you're watching this on, and I'll put those questions through, through to Pago. Um, but one thing I just wanted to, to start with is with that kind of, um, as you were saying, with the positioning, because you could have toothbrush, you could have mouthwash, you could have maybe chewing gum. There's lots of these things that are all trying to tackle the same problem of, oh, I want my, I don't like that feeling of roughness on my teeth. When I was listening to that, I was thinking about in product management, there's a lot of um, talk about the jobs to be done framework and that you're not necessarily competing. Netflix isn't competing with Disney. They're competing with somebody going to the movies, somebody doing something else with their evenings other than watching TV. So my question there is, do you see a large overlap between product management and marketing? or And where do you see the, the actual boundary between who is trying to define the positioning and the, the kind of the messaging around a product? I always think that, that should start with the product management side of things, you know, especially from the ideator that, you know, that, that proverbial cocktail napkin generally starts on the, the build cycle, right? The ideation for what it is that we have. Um, You'll see brands that come in uh, on the tail end where the marketing drives the product. That's not incorrect. Um, I just think that they need to, you know, from a marketer's perspective, and obviously I spent most of my time, like I said, half, halfway as, as a builder, uh, halfway as a, as a marketer, you know, there's, there's, there's some to be, so something to be learned by both. And I think from the product development side and the product management side, getting the insights about the market research and positioning the, the why you're building this, all the all the uh, the focus group testing that you might do, all the all the intent based work that you do, um, has to forward has to be played forward into what you're communicating outbound. Um, frequently, it's difficult to articulate what you want to do as the product manager, right? At the end of that, you know, I use I use physicians, love physicians, smartest people in the world, right? Doctors, but they are themselves not maybe the best marketers. But holy, mac holy mackerel, they, they, they can actually do all the work, you know, surgical diagnosis, et cetera. So you'll have to take a little bit of the grain of salt with them, you know, from a messaging perspective to bring that forward. Software, hardware, you know, whatever, whatever kind of platforms you talk about, it, 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 it varies significantly. But I think that's a management responsibility overall. Yeah, you, you touched on um, a point there um, that I really liked. It's just about the at what point does marketing come in? Because there's a big push um, to kind of move towards product teams where there's kind of cross-functional instead of throwing something over the wall or product, just throwing over, here's here's some research and here's a product. Now you go, you go sell it to people and make sure they buy it. Um, where do you see, do you see a bit more of marketing coming in early and really working and collaborating with the team kind of before that launch? Uh, yes, <laughs> the earlier, the better. Uh, and this is where, you know, operational diagrams or structures or workflows like races or, you know, kind of responsibility matrices work out, um, you know, from a marketer perspective, it is about, uh, understanding what I'm doing to push this forward. Right. And, uh, it's not something that we, we have to learn more about the so what before we get into the, you know, the developing the asset going forward. So I, I don't like the silos, you know, I don't like the hard walls where it's like, okay, I've hit my design objective or I've hit my MVP or I've hit some kind of milestone along the way, because, you know, there might be some market insights that you're actually get, gathering from, you know, the sales side or the customer insights perspective that are direct directly could influence what product is being developed on the back end that could, you know, that could be much more symbiotic in terms of how they, they improve. So um, short answer. Yeah. Marketing should be pulled in earlier. We also need to learn to be quiet, right. And listen to the product, 
understand what the, you know, the so what behind the vision and the idea rather than coming over the, you know, that we've, I've heard this from the sales team. I've heard this from, you know, customers. I've heard this from, you know, the industry, blah, 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 my opinion. Um, and let the product be the product, right? I mean, let the product really take it forward um, and then build the story and the narrative, what we like to call air cover, right? I'm going to, I'm going to go in there and promote something specifically, but I need to provide the air cover from a marketing perspective, but it's got to be based on, you know, the, the, the brilliance of what, sparked the innovation to begin with great no it's um it, very much my my opinion on things as well it's always i hate seeing the kind of the, the throw over the wall and then the marketing right. message and the product they don't fully line up and right right all those problems yep one thing and it's kind of slightly left field but any, anybody else can ask questions please do type them in um but one thing that with your example of the iPod and a story that I always remember because I thought it was quite interesting, Apple, when they saw that there was a little bit of traction with the iPod, they decided to take all of their Mac advertising budget and put it all into the iPod. Okay. And so everything went into one. How do you think teams can work like that in an ecosystem where you have multiple products and, and the net result for people because the iPod was so popular it actually resulted in an increase in Mac sales. So For sure. by moving their budget over, it was a good, a good strategy. So how do you think teams, which tend to be kind of, if you're building a product, you're, you're very much focused on yours. How do you try to help people to see those ecosystem synergies? Ooh, bottoms up or tops down, it's going to be interesting. You know, from teams to associate that uh, unilaterally is going to take a very um, brave, and kind of unique team to really be able to think from an unbiased perspective, right? Bias, uh, bias is horrible from a from a research perspective, especially when we do focus groups or UX or some of those components. So we want to leave our biases aside and truly evaluate what uh, what your what your peers have to offer. And that's where you know not all teams are are are, are created equally. And that's that's not a criticism or an indictment. That is. If you don't have the ability to tell your story, your positioning, your value prop, your all all your stuff, even though before it gets into the marketing hierarchy, um, how can you let your own development teams kind of peer review and, and and do it bottoms up? You know, from an Apple perspective, that was just you know going all in on on a product that you're absolutely right. It lifted the entire brand right up, and everything. Became, and we all know what happened after that. And it's you know it, it's. It's reinforced the cult of, of, of Mac and, you know, and, and expanded it beyond. Very few companies um, are willing to, <laughs> it's a horrible phrase, sacrifice their young to really, you know, play to the greater good. And that's part of, you know, my responsibility as a, as a builder or an engineer is to get something from sprint to sprint, from, you know, from milestone to milestone, from whatever it is. And I don't pick my head up and go, what else is going on? And I think... You know the collaboration and the in the in the I don't know the ability for people to actually understand where um, software within an organization works with the piece of hardware that might be building built right next door can commingle to create I don't know something called iTunes and a piece of hardware you know and I think it's just having visibility in terms of what your overall portfolio is and hopefully. Um, you know, having the the visibility and the empathy to actually identify those and 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 say, don't promote myself. I'm going to promote you this time, or maybe rally folks to promote them. It's a, it's a it's a different behavior. You know, it's a, in, especially in a credit driven world. Yeah, I, I can imagine some internal politics at play in one of those decisions. But <laughs> right, I think right. Steve Jobs was able to make those unilateral <laughs> choices. Yeah. Um, but I think that brings us to time. So thank you very much, Pago. I really enjoyed that. And thank you for sharing. Thank you. OK, so up next, uh, we have Justin, who is the Director of Product Strategy and Design at Studio Science. And Justin will be talking about service design for product designers. So welcome, Justin. How are you doing? Thanks so much. Thanks for hosting. And hey, everyone else, thanks for joining today. Um, yeah, I'll like to, to, to you now. So, I'll... sounds good. Um, well, yeah, my name is Justin Zaluski, and like Rory said, I'm the director of product strategy and design at Studio Science, we're a design and innovation consultancy. And today, I'm going to talk to you about service design, uh, specifically what we as product designers can adopt from a service design 
uh, mentality and mindset to be more effective in our roles. But first, I want to let you know, uh, I am not going to today try and draw or redraw the lines between product design, UX design, CX design, interaction design, service design, all these other labels that we use. I just find it so tedious and unproductive. Um, and so I really want to focus today's conversation on just how do we get better at our craft of designing products and experiences. So I'm going to use the term product designer today, and I'm going to use it in this talk only to mean a designer that's working on a company's digital product. So they work on or at least with the product team at their org, but title might be product designer, UX designer, etc. So I'm not going to talk about all that. What I am going to talk about is how product designers can benefit from incorporating a service design approach and skill set. But let's start here. Uh, you know, some of us have probably already heard about service design, but let's make sure we're all starting with the same kind of foundation. So what even is service design? There's a lot of different definitions out there, but here are a couple of my favorites that I think really encapsulate uh, what's what's valuable and what's unique about service design. So this first one from Live Work, um, I love that this emphasizes that it's the application of established design processes and skills. It's not reinventing the wheel. Um, you know, the, a lot of the design process and thinking behind it is going to be the same, but we're thinking in terms of services rather than touch points. And then the second one from Bridget Madger, um, what I love about this is the emphasis on uh, we are choreographing these different aspects of a service, you know, the processes, technologies, and interactions. So we don't need to be the ones to invent the new technologies of interactions. Service design is a great connector of disciplines. And so when we think of ourselves in the role of, um, you know, choreographing or facilitating, bringing people together that are experts in these, these fields, um, you know, we can help to break down these silos and really take the, that top level holistic view of it. Um, and then I love the second part here as well of emphasizing that co-creation aspect. We're not just creating on others' behalf, we are co-creating with other stakeholders. We'll talk more about co-creation a little bit today too. So one of the first things I want to call out today is the difference in the mindset. So these digital products that we work on today, or, or so many of us work on today, are not just tools that people use. They are services that are designed to meet the needs of customers along some kind of journey. So for example, we could think of Airbnb as a product or an app, but Airbnb is a service. Airbnb serves the customer along the various stages of their vacation journey. And even on the B2B side, we could think of DocuSign as a product, but DocuSign is also a service. DocuSign serves their customers along the journey of getting a deal done, document signed, you know, what have you. So because these digital products are more like services than they are like products, product designers can be more effective by using a service design approach. Um, you know, again, not getting into labels, not trying to advocate for title changes or anything like that. Um, you know, there is uh, value to be had um, in those different disciplines and, and all that, but that is not what this is about. Um, I want to focus us on how we can use that service mindset to evaluate and design improvements by looking more holistically at an experience rather than simply at the touch points. And that brings me to this. If you come away with just one thought out of this, I want you to remember that a clickable prototype is not enough. Um, we love our clickable prototypes as designers, right? Uh, and the clickable prototypes is so often the artifact and the point of focus for product designers today. And now without reason, you know, clickable prototypes are so much easier to produce now. And we have more than enough options for how to create them. Um, most of the time, the teams that we work with tend to spend a majority of their time and focus and budgets on the most visible parts of the experience. So designing these visible parts with a clickable prototype makes sense in that way, right? But here's the problem. When we stop at the clickable prototype, we ignore some of the most important elements of an experience and the service. Um, and those are you know, the space between the touch points and what's required to make that service a reality. And by that, I mean, you know, what, who are the people, the processes, the systems that support that end customer experience? Let's talk a little bit about each of those. So the space between the touch points, What's happening with your customers when they're not looking at the screens that you've designed? You know, what, um, what are they distracted by? Um, what other kinds of notifications are they receiving? How much time is passing? All these things, they change their context, their needs, their goals, um, and how that experience feels to a customer as it's experienced in reality, not just as a touch point in a vacuum, is really what we wanna be thinking about and what we wanna optimize for. 
So therein lies the problem with clickable prototypes. They're so focused on a linked set of screens rather than the reality of a person's experience, which can occur through different channels and different spans of time. But that can be difficult, right? That introduces some, some challenge. Like how do we prototype and test an experience over different channels, over spans of time? Well, I like the way that the, author, the authors of a book called Service Design Doing put it. So I'm gonna borrow their terminology. Um, they talk about direct experience versus indirect imagination. So direct experience is where people use the prototype or experience the prototype in a way that lets them experience it themselves firsthand um, versus direct imagination, or sorry, indirect imagination, which helps people to imagine the intended experience. And it's not totally binary. There's all kinds of gray area between the two, but you can think of these as two parts of a spectrum, right? So um, direct experience has a lot of advantages as you might imagine. Um, you know, it's, it's the most direct representation of the experience. So you can get the most genuine feedback and learning from that. Um, but oftentimes we run into obstacles with scope, timeline, budget, or participant availability, um, where indirect imagination can be a great option as well. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those too. So first example of, of direct experience, um, at Studio Science, we're working with one of our clients. They're a fortune 500 engine manufacturing company. And we co-designed this pilot program with the employees that would be responsible for supporting this new service. Um, so there would be these uh, account reps that would be involved in this process. There's a, a digital part of the experience, um, but there's also a lot of people interactions within this. So we co-designed this pilot program and the pilot program had the participants um, who were you know, employees uh, in, in this case um, that tested this newly designed service over the course of a week um, and the, we would learn how the new service is working through daily feedback prompts, personal check-ins from our team at key points. Um, so we get together valuable feedback, the employees get to test it out, see how it works for them. And we de-risk the new service for the business by testing it with a small cohort of customers before any larger rollouts. Now let's contrast that with indirect imagination in an example here. Um, with that exact same client, in another situation, we were not able to line up a pilot program due to uh, time constraints of the participants, um, but we were able to set up specific scenarios in a moderated user test that helped the participants understand and provide feedback on this new multi-channel services. So here's what we did. And I'm gonna show you a few screens of the prototype that we used on this project that I led, um, but the prototype has been anonymized to remove the client name and logo. Uh, and uh, this particular prototype is a mix of work done by two very talented designers, Evan Strader and Seth Richardson. Um, we had participants go through this registration process using a typical, a typical clickable prototype. But when they got to this stage where they've submitted the initial registration, they're kind of done for a while. They need to wait for the client to approve their request, which can sometimes take a few days, depending on the variety of technical and legal factors. So we can't just jump them to the next screen that they'll see because that's not how it'll work in reality. We have to kind of reset the stage. So we say to the participant, now, after you submit your registration, imagine that a couple of days pass. You continue on with business as usual at your shop. What are your expectations of the company during this time? And when we ask these kinds of open-ended questions, it helps us to test whether the experience that preceded this actually set expectations well enough, and it gets the participant to really imagine what they'd be thinking, feeling, and experiencing, um, and what they'd be expecting uh, during this in-between time. And then we transition back into the clickable prototype by saying something like, now imagine that later that afternoon, you received this email in your inbox. And then we can pick back up on the usual clickable prototype testing process from there. So even though this was indirect and we had to have the participants you know, use their imagination, uh, we still uncovered valuable insights about how these gaps in time would affect the experience for them and how we could adjust to better meet those needs. And we did that by intentionally framing up the scenarios with them using you know, storytelling. All right, now the second thing that clickable prototypes make it really easy to ignore is what's required to make the service a reality. So we find a lot of times organizations are trying to improve customer experience by designing touch points across the end-to-end -end journey. And they believe this will better serve customers' needs. However, 
these initiatives are usually one-sided and they fail to account for the complete system that supports that customer experience. So in service design, we refer to the supporting system as the, the backstage of the service. These are the people, the processes and technologies that are required to enable that customer experience. And when we map out the backstage, it's a great opportunity for co-design. So we've all probably had this experience of having a new process dictated to us that requires us to do more work or maybe to work in a way that we know doesn't fit the reality of the situation. And it's frustrating, right? So when we co-design with the people that are involved with the service, we can help prevent this for them. Um, so they're not being designed for, they're being designed with. And then as a result, our solutions are then much stronger because we're learning from their lived experience and it de-risks the solution going forward. Because when we ignore the backstage, it introduces all kinds of risks for the company um, and for, for the team. Um, we could fail to implement the intended experience. So when we design around all kinds of assumptions about capabilities, it adds risk to implementation. An organization might design a touch points that require uh, customer data from the CRM without realizing it's in this old legacy system that makes integration really difficult or we might be trying to improve delivery times and we design some system that requires additional work from warehouse employees, but they're already operating at max capacity. Um, so when we map out the front stage and backstage of a service, uh, you know, for example, using a service blueprint, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, it helps us to identify and account for those capabilities before they become blockers. The second risk is we could fail to actually deliver that intended experience. So being blocked in implementation is certainly frustrating, but implementing a service that fails to actually deliver value uh, could lead to even worse outcomes. It could be high customer churn, low customer adoption, a damaged brand reputation. So when we design the service holistically and with the relevant stakeholders, customers and employees, um, it helps to ensure that that organization can actually deliver the service and that we're not uh, at risk of making empty promises. And then finally, a big risk is that we could burden that team that is tasked with delivering the service. Um, we could fail to support them. They might end up shouldering the burden of a poorly planned solution. Um, and when organizations do this, they, they push forward a solution that doesn't really consider the impact on employees. Um, employees get burned out, as you might imagine, uh, because they're trying to achieve goals that the design of the service makes impossible. So employees feel undervalued. They might feel resentful, like leadership is out of touch with the reality of their jobs. And uh, when you've got a, a problem like that, no amount of training or employee engagement initiatives or fancy perks or anything like that is going to address the root problem of unrealistic demands at your job. Now, another example here um, of kind of a, a surprise benefit of um, mapping out the, the backstage and, and all the systems required for a service. Uh, we were working with this client of ours on a customer adoption problem where they had built uh, a robust digital product to help their employees follow this proprietary process, but people weren't using it. So we went in and mapped the service blueprint along the customer journey, figured out where is the design of the service misaligned with the reality of the employee experience. You know, no surprise there. But what was surprising is that we found other departments trying to tackle this same problem through different one-sided solutions. So we kind of had one of these moments where we're like, hey, you know, tech platform team, like you're also trying to solve the same customer adoption issue, but, you know, tackling it from a, a kind of technology first perspective, we need to learn more about the technology and we can bring the customer perspective through the research we've been doing. Um, so we're able to realign the departments around one common goal and this holistic approach saved the organization months of time and effort that would have been totally redundant. So um, starting to, to bring it all in and, and make it tactical, these digital services that we are designing require an aspect of service design. Um, and that, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, we need to uh, call it that, um, but keeping this kind of you know, service-oriented mindset um, and bringing this into our work is going to be really valuable to help us all make a, a bigger impact. So here are two ways that I recommend people start. So first is to build relationships um, and building relationships is such a critical part of co-design. Um, but I also want to recognize that it's not always easy, um, especially for, for me. I'm very introverted and it would be much easier for me to design by myself in a room, listening to music with nobody to bother me. But that is just not how change happens, especially in services and especially in larger companies where 
um, you know, there, there's just so many people involved in actually delivering a service um, and, uh, you know, when it can impact uh, so many people. And the second thing is to map your service with a service blueprint. Um, and I'll talk about this in, in just a second. Um, you know, a lot of us are probably familiar with mapping out the, the customer journey, um, which, and this is just one form that a service blueprint can take. Um, but this is a template that we put together at Studio Science, and I'll, I'll provide a link to uh, download this on the Figma community for anybody interested. Um, but uh, you can think of that top row as you know, pretty synonymous with a, a customer um, journey. It's, it's really mapping the customer actions. But um, what uh, moving one layer deeper into a service blueprint helps you do is map those other layers um, so down into you know, what uh, on the, the front stage, you know, what are employees uh, at the company doing, for example, to enable that customer experience? You know, who are they, uh, inter who are customers interfacing with at uh, physical retail locations? Um, you know, what kinds of like, you know, emails are they, they seeing in their inbox? Um, and then going to the backstage, it's, you know, what's happening behind the scenes that the customer might not necessarily see, but these are critical factors to actually enable this experience. So we can map out along each stage of the journey, like what backend systems are in place or need to be in place if we're looking at future state, um, what kinds of uh, employees need to be trained in certain situations, you know, what, what people does this rely on? Um, which helps us you know, not only account for the capabilities, but also lets us know who do we need to bring into this process to make sure this is all going to work the way we need it to work. So if you want to try this out and, uh, and check out a template, here's a, a quick link to um, download that, that free template on Figma community. Um, but yeah, to sum this all up, here are the three main points I want to emphasize to bring a service design mindset into our work. Um, we need to be considering the experience more holistically. So we got to make sure that the service that we're designing addresses the needs of all stakeholders throughout the entire service. And second, we need to shift our thinking from touch points to the journey. So think about how that customer interacts at each stage of their journey um, and keeping in mind that services are sequential. And when we can visualize this uh, in a service blueprint, for example, um, and design those interactions and those experiences at each stage, um, it's going to help keep us more focused on how customers actually experience that um, broader than just a clickable prototype. And finally, um, taking a co-creation approach. Um, we need to design solutions with internal and external stakeholders. Um, and by that, I mean you know, the decision makers within the business and members of the target audience, of course. Uh, but also, uh, you know, let's not forget about all the people that are involved throughout the process that are required to make that new service a reality or that will be affected by the new service. Um, so you know, where, where do you need to break down silos and get in touch with um, people on the engineering team um, that are going to be affected by this or might have uh, insight and knowledge into the systems that will support, um, you know, who do you need to build relationships with on the finance team, uh, even to understand, like, you know, how, how do we need the payment processing of this new solution to work um, and so on. Um, so, yeah, um, keep these three points in mind um, as you start to consider the experience more holistically transfer your thinking from touch points to journey and uh, embrace a, a co-creation approach to um, the services and experiences that you're designing. And I'd be happy to take some questions now. Excellent, thank you very much, Justin. Um, so just a reminder to everybody out there, if you do have any questions, please do write them in on whichever platform that you're watching on and we'll pass those questions through to Justin. Um, I, I loved, your kind of uh, example of, of moving from just building a product. And I can't remember the person who said it and it's going to bug me, but she said, I always have to remind myself, I'm not designing a page. I'm designing a process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, I always think that that's such a great way of thinking about it because we, we fall into the trap of just going, okay, I just need a page here and I need another page, but you always need to be thinking what the user's process is that they're going through. Yeah, exactly. I, I think, a lot of us got into the design field, even if we're not like strictly visual designers, but what drew us in maybe is because we tend to be very visual people. Um, and so it's really easy to get, you know, seduced by the visual deliverable um, and kind of forget about everything that's behind it and alongside it. Yeah, I know I'm guilty of that. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Um, one of the things is you were kind of going through that. So 
one of the benefits of saying I'm designing a page is it's nice and neat and it's kind of compact. But once you start considering, okay, everybody who's interacting with this, what's the user doing? This kind of scale of it just keeps expanding. So how do you avoid kind of, um, what, what's that example? Oh, how do you change a light bulb? First you create the universe and then you, <laughs> like, so it's, um, how do you keep the scope kind of manageable? Yeah, that, that's a great question because it can get, you know, overwhelming because you could take it to an infinite extent, right? Like, I think you got to know like where to, where to start and where to stop. Right. Um, so I, I advocate for two things. Um, one is to take an, an iterative approach. Uh, you know, if this is, you know, a, a new thing for your team or organization, um, to not try to do too much, um, all at once, um, you know, to go from, um, you know, the step of mapping the customer journey to starting to add in other layers of what supports the, the customer journey or, um, you know, there might be many different kinds of services and experiences at your organization. So, you know, don't try to map everything all at once, you know, find a place to start and you'll find out like, what, what process and what um, level of, of scale and scope, um, you know, is, is feasible for your team. And then the other thing that can be a challenge sometimes is figuring out, you know, who all do we like, we can find millions of people to <laughs> include in the process. Um, and so I like, there's a, there's a great book um, that uh, I think it's called uh, co-design for real beyond sticky notes. Um, but I want to say Kellyan Kircher, I could be getting her, her name wrong, but if you Google that combination of words, surely, uh, you'll find the right result. Um, but she advocates for, um, the, this approach where with co-design, you've got this, this, uh, core group, this inner circle, um, of like, you know, who are the, the best representation of, of the stakeholders and the kinds of experiences that we need to bring into the process. Um, but also to establish your, your, um, your bigger circle. Um, of knowing like here are these other perspectives we need to make sure are brought in to inform different elements of the service but we don't need to um we don't need to demand quite as much of their time um so you know we can be respectful of how much uh, of people's time we take um but also just to be realistic about how many people can uh you know can productively uh be a, be a part of um a collaboration like that Great. No, it's a, it's a good point. The more people you have, the slower and everything tends to, tends to go. One of the points that your slide of like the frustration of being added, um, kind of the people who will have to support this, like, so you don't want to make their jobs harder because they have to support it. But how do you balance the conflict of it might make the end user's job easier by making the back end person's job harder. So how do you, what is the best way of managing those? Because then you might lose kind of the, I don't know, trust of the stakeholder or kind of the confidence. And um, how do you play that and how do you manage that? Yeah, so I think there it's, it's important to emphasize how much the quality of the employee experience actually affects the end customer experience. Um, where a, a stakeholder within the business might take the perspective of, oh, we could, if we just sacrifice this element of the employee experience, we could actually, it could be a boon to customer experience. Um, and there, you know, there's so much studies about, um, you know, like our, um, our CEO, Steve Pruden turned me on to the, um, uh, the value service chain. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of writing about this, of the, you know, how that so directly affects um, the customer experience when employees are um, unhappy or, or not empowered or overworked. Um, and that all these things that might seem like a good idea on paper is just like, it, let's just give them like 20% more. Or if, if we could just like move this responsibility over to this department, like, you know, on paper, that would fix so much. Right. Um, but, you know, without the actual perspective from the employees that are delivering that work. Um, well, let me say it this way. Contrast that kind of like top-down delegate, you know, well delegated, top-down dictated approach with a co-creation approach. We could then learn like um, from the employees. Maybe there are ways to actually be more efficient in the work, so that actually it could cut costs because maybe management is assuming that like all these things need to be done, and the employee might know some things that management does not. Uh, I will say often knows things that management does not. 
um, where they could know like, all right, like here are the things that are actually, you know, we see making a difference for customers and that are like critical to keep things moving forward. But all of our time is taking up with these other things too. Um, it just gives you so much more insight to actually figure out where to prioritize um, so that you can, you know, not sacrifice the employee experience because that's going to damage the customer experience inevitably. Um, but, you know, can still find um, some good middle ground where we're still able to, um, you know, optimize uh, for the, the business outcomes as well. Some of which are sometimes keeping costs in check. Yeah. As you were explaining that, the, what popped into my head, because I love that answer, but it was the the decisions of management. And I always think of being on a call and it's like, we're experiencing higher than usual volume, but your call is very important to us. Yeah. Uh, they're I saw somebody higher than usual volumes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was um, somebody the other day uh, I saw say something like, don't tell me that you're experiencing higher than average call volumes you're always experiencing that's not how averages work it can't always be higher than average yeah now brilliant that that finishes my questions um i haven't seen so kasim i know that you were commenting before i'm not seeing any any more questions come in but i think um i'll wrap up there so i just want to thank you once again justin for sharing sharing your insights and knowledge yeah thanks for thanks for hosting thanks everyone for joining Excellent. So that brings us to the end of our event today. Um, but before we leave, I just want to say very quickly that if you did enjoy this talk and this event, we are hosting a conference in New York in five weeks' time. Um, so we'll have 25 speakers. There'll be 500 attendees. Um, we have 12 workshops now, actually. So if you like the concept of breaking down the silos between product, UX, design, dev, and marketing, um, please do come along because they're fantastic kind of talks and experience in the, we're off Broadway in New York. Um, but if you can't make it to that, then I look forward to seeing you at the next UXDX online.